Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Ian Kavat. On May 20th next year, President Tsai Ing-wen steps down at the end of her second term. As we enter Tsai's final year, we take a look at her presidency. With me to discuss this are William Stanton, former American Institute in Taiwan director, National Zhengzhou University chair professor. Also, Jerry Liu, former Taiwan Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Central and East European Affairs section chief, and Raymond Song, Taiwan New Constitution Foundation affiliated researcher, and Chen Bingkui, National Zhengzhou University Associate Professor of Diplomacy. Um, everyone, a very warm welcome to the show today. Thank you. Thank you. Taiwan's first female president was elected in January 2016 by a landslide after eight years of Ma Zhou from the China-friendly Kuomintang, or KMT. During his second term, Ma had moved closer to China with a trade pact negotiated behind closed doors between the KMT and the Chinese Communist Party. 2014 triggered Taiwan's largest protest movement since the White Lily Movement. The Sunflower protesters campaigned against what they saw as Taiwan's economic integration with China. Protesters blockaded the legislative yuan for weeks to force the then KMT government to drop the deal. The Sunflower movement is widely accepted as a main reason Tsai was brought to power two years later. In 2020, Tsai won her second term in another landslide vote. This time it was a reaction to China's crackdown on freedoms in Hong Kong. Taiwanese saw the hollowing out of Beijing's promise of one country, two systems, a model the CCP also offers to Taiwan. Now, according to the latest Taiwan Public Opinion Foundation survey, Tsai Ing-wen's performance in office has scored 60.29. That's not significantly lower than Tsai's highest annual approval rating of 61.55 points in May 2022. Last year, her worst, 52.41 points, was in 2017 on the first anniversary of taking office. Professor, if I could come to you first. Now, if we compare President Ma Ying uh, approval rating, he actually had a 70% mm. disapproval rating and around 20% yeah. approval rating at the same point, so in 2015, a year before he stepped down. What do you make of Tsai Ing-wen's polling? I think uh, one thing that we can observe from this poll is that uh, about 30%, 28.9% of people gave Tsai a, a scroll over 80%. So that means at least 30% of people approve Chai. But there are a lot of people who uh, gave lower grade. That's why the average is much lower than we expected. Uh, but uh, the foundation recently released another poll about uh, opinion on Chai's um, DPP and Chai's uh, governance. So uh, basically, the poll shows that the median voters or the swing voters they are undecided and they are feeling distaste on DPP right now. Mm, you said that they're feeling? They're feeling uh, bad about the DP DPP right now. Right, I see. Um, Ambassador, if I can come to you, do you think that reflects, um, in your view, um, Tsai ing -wen's seven years of, of, of office? I don't think so, because from my perspective, I, when Ma ying Zhou was president, I was at AIT, and I remember how difficult it was to really make some progress in our bilateral relationship. And in comparison, one of the things I note about uh, Tsai Ing-wen is the great improvement overall uh, within the international community for Taiwan, but it also overlooks major achievements like her success and her administration's success in handling the COVID-19 uh, mm. pandemic. And, you know, in fact, I was looking the other day because I'm giving a lecture this week on Taiwan, and uh, there's a poll showing that in the, among the top 15 economies in the world, Taiwan had the lowest rate of fatalities. I mean, it's just, you know, three figures as opposed to some that were, the United States was the worst. It was over a million, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then when you look at other factors like the, uh, particularly with regard to the U.S., it's been a massive improvement in the relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't think it, it reflects sufficiently the success that she's had as president. And it may be that people are dissatisfied also with other things mm. within their lives. I don't know. Okay. Jerry Liu, if mm. I can come to you next. Yeah. So um, COVID, um, U.S. relations mm. are highlights, but people are still dissatisfied 
What, 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 do, what would you take from the seven years? Yeah, I think compared with the four years ago, there is a main difference here uh, for the, for the uh, election next year, which will be how the young voters think about the possibility of um, a war breaking out in Taiwan. That is a, a totally different factor compared with the four years ago. And that's why the KMT uh, is trying to advocate in the possibility of uh, having a conflict in the Taiwan Strait. So I would say this would be a main difference. And the other things that I, uh, I agree with what uh, Bill just said about the, uh, how the Tsai Ing-wen uh, government handled the, the COVID-19. But uh, if you take a look um, carefully, in the very beginning of the, uh, the pandemic, I think the public in Taiwan actually gave a very high scores about uh, how the government was handling the pandemic. However, as, as time went by, um, I think the situation became a little bit different, especially focusing um, the procurement of the vaccines. And I think, um, you know, one of the, um, uh, the promising candidate from the, the KMT, uh, Mr. Terry Guo, was trying to say how much um, effort he has spent to procure the, the vaccine. So I think that will become one of the factors in determining the public's opinions on the present for next year. Mm. Yeah. I think uh, being a Taiwanese president is not an easy job. It has uh, several fronts, internal politics and uh, the distribution of wealth between generations, and also the very complicated uh, uh, geopolitical and international situation to handle. And Tsai Ing-wen has been a calm and stable voice through all this. I will give her a very high mark. And uh, I, to me, his remarkable legacy remains with the deepening of Taiwanese democracy in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, advancing the human rights protection, for example, the uh, realization of the uh, same-sex marriage protection. Mm. I believe and, uh, that in also the e Economist um, Index, the Democracy Index, of course, yes. we're the, the, the number one democracy, full democracy in Asia yes, for, yes. for a, f a few years running now. And uh, also raising the international profile of Taiwan as a general, and uh, also putting the security of international and the uh, Taiwanese Taiwan Strait mm -hmm. to the forefront of the geopolitical and international global security scene, mm -hmm. which is a uh, very, very remarkable differences from uh, the previous Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan has been in the code for so such a long time, but mm -hmm. in Tsai ing all those being reversed. Mm. On, on that point, so how would you say Taiwan's global standing, Raymond, has changed um, over eight years? I mean, I mean, that's I guess that's what you're saying. How about we, we ask this question? How well has Taiwan positioned itself in relation to China on the international stage? I, I, we will devote more time on this, of mm -hmm. course. I, I will firstly argue that the tensions between across the street between China and Taiwan uh, it's not the fault on the Taiwan administration. Actually, it was fabricated by the Xi Jinping's uh, political agenda out of his own need or the C CCP's time uh, gen agenda to, to take over Taiwan. And uh, I will just give one brief example. The, at the beginning of the Tsai's elections, and even before his, her inauguration, and uh, actually, we, we've been he hearing from the, the think tanks from China saying that Tsai is a dangerous figure. She will advance in Taiwanese independence and will bring such a disastrous result to this geopolitical scene, which is not the case. Actually, uh, time and time again, Tsai Tsai Ching Wen has been a stable voice. It will give the U.S. no surprise and will do anything uh, will not do anything which will risk the Taiwan security. And which, uh, but even that, given that, her being a, such a stable and calm voice, but Chinese attack on her is, is a fiercer. Uh, so as we see the uh, current situation and also on the internal front about the losing faith of the younger generation, younger voters in Taiwan and also uh, very, very treacherous uh, un uncharted waters you know, across Taiwan Strait. Mm. Professor Bing Kui. Um, I think I agree with uh, Raymond that Tsai has been portrayed by Chinese government and Chinese officials as a maniacal 
character, uh, <laughs> but it, she is not. And she successfully maintained an image uh, that is prudent, calm, and decisive, mm. um, at, at least to uh, the United States and other relevant countries. So mm. I think that's a very successful move. Uh, Tsai, and it does not reflect on Taiwan itself? Well, it in may, relation maybe to China. not, because people won't pay attention to Tsai's uh, diplomatic uh, engagement with other leaders. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but indeed, Tsai has left that uh, impression on other leaders. So I always argue that um, what really determines cross-strait relations is the United States, is in Washington. So if Washington believes that Taiwan is stirring the water, then it will punish Taiwan. If, if, if Washington believes that it is Beijing who is still stealing the water, then it will warn Beijing about it. So, mm. um, so actually, what Tsai did successfully for the past seven years is that it reassured Washington mm. that she would not do any surprise move, and, mm. and she successful, successfully did it. I think that is, that is her legacy, and mm -hmm. she has to keep on that legacy, make sure the next DPP leader will enforce such uh, very calm and stable, reassured diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, Ambassador? Well, I think the main factor in the cross-strait relationship has been the bullying character of uh, Xi Jinping. Um, over there, I guess, since he came to power beginning in 2011. It's a long time he's been in charge. And um, the insistence, for example, uh, that there's uh, one China, and that has to be the premise. I mean, uh, going back to the unfortunate 1979 Shanghai communique, there the United States stated or agreed to state that people on both sides of the strait acknowledge there's but one China. But that was never the case because they never polled the people on either side of the strait. This was just the opinion of leaders. Um, the same thing with the, you know, the shibboleth that there's one China that they insist on. Um, you know, it's, it's just playing with words, really. Um, but the United States, I think, uh, does recognize how, in such a positive way, uh, saying when is handled diplomacy. And the hope is, I think, that um, this will continue. I think there's some concern among uh, China watchers that if Terry Guo or the KMT comes in, we're going to go back to the road we had followed in the past, or Taiwan will. And, um, you know, to elect a president like uh, Terry Guo, who has major economic interests in the mainland, this is very worrisome to me. I mean, one thing you can say about Tsai is she had no personal stake. Uh, she was just doing what she believed was the right thing. Mm. So um, yeah. I'm very concerned about the next election, and I hope that uh, Lai Ching Da wins my, my own view for the future of Taiwan. Okay. I think it'd be um, good to bring in um, the Tsai Ing-wen's character. We've talked about, um, you know, how she was calm, and Professor mentioned calm and rational. Um, she um, had, going back to the early years, um, even before she became president, she was described as bookish, you know, academic, you know, maybe even shy, want, not wanting to be in the limelight. Um, so um, I guess the question is, you know, has she actually defied her critics? Let's take a look at. Um, we've got Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2020. Um, this was a uh, text written by uh, Senator Ted Cruz. Uh, President Tsai Ing-wen is a signal lamp casting out China's looming shadow, conveying to the world that Taiwan will not acquiesce to the Chinese Communist Party. So this is the themes that, that Ambassador, you mentioned. And there's also Forbes. Um, she was number nine in Forbes 2021 Most Powerful Women. Um, she was also, I think it was 14th in um, 2022. But in 2021, and the editors wrote, Tsai won re-election in 2020 with more than 57% of the popular vote. Her victory was seen as a rebuke to Beijing's efforts to control the island. Um, Jerry, yes. do you think, you know, with, with these sorts of <laughs> recognition, hmm. has she, actually put Taiwan, you know, on the, on the global map? And has she become uh, one of the important leaders in the world? I would say one of the most important 
uh, achievements for Tsai Ing-wen is to make sure there is a growing sentiment in the U.S. bipartisan that loves Taiwan instead of, instead of uh, uh, siding with China. And that is a very different thing compared with four or even eight years ago. So in the uh, diplomatic um, uh, side, I would say uh, Tsai Ing-wen did a very good job. How, however, I would say one of the downsides for her is trying to, is, is try to convince the Taiwanese that in terms of the international participation, there can be some, something concrete done. Just say the World Health Assembly, the WHA, is going to take place, uh, I believe it will be next week, something? Yes. Next week. Yes. So uh, Tsai Ing-wen took place in the year of 2016, and uh, that was actually the only year that uh, Taiwan could participate as an observer. And uh, after 2016, Taiwan has been unable to participate as an observer. I would personally hope that if the U.S. is very eager to uh, help Taiwan's international participation, maybe this year the U.S. can give more concrete and substantial support to advocate the word that Taiwan should be part of the uh, international health uh, regime. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other side... I, I uh, think ultimately, though, it's China's decision, isn't it? Yeah, China so, has the veto. So no, there's no? no veto in there the world. There is no veto. <laughs> no. no, there's no yeah. veto. So it's just a majority rule. And we also get reporting recently that the Europeans are very, Western Europeans at least, are very mm -hmm. strongly in favor mm -hmm. of Taiwan's participation. Right. So mm -hmm. in terms of the international participation, I would say there is a still room for improvement. But in terms of the U.S.-Taiwan ties, I think Taiwan did a very good job. Mm -hmm. But uh, however, I would say we, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, government is still abiding you know, the one China policy. And although Biden, uh, President Biden has been uh, re repeatedly talking about that if there's something happening in the Taiwan Strait, the U.S. will defend Taiwan mm -hmm. and Jerry, automatically corrected by <laughs> his staff. And no. so I would say this the but strategic- But said it four times. Yeah. Four times, correct. And, yeah, and we will so get onto this in a, in okay, later, in a yeah. later part. Let me just give the last word, apologies, Raymond, um, to, to Professor Bing Wei. Yes. Um, Ambassador touched on this briefly. He talked about perhaps a next leader and what we don't want. Mm. Um, what kind of leader does Taiwan need um, going into the next four, possibly um, eight years? Is it somebody with a character oh. like Tsai Ing-wen? I think, I think uh, my personal opinion is that Taiwan really needs a president, a leader who, uh, who can convince the United States, who understand what the United States wants, because um, we have been depending on the United States for very, very long time. And this is uh, arguably the best bargaining chip we have against uh, mainland China. So uh, maintaining the U.S.-Taiwan relationship will be the, always be the priority. And uh, as for the for leadership, uh, not only in foreign affairs, but also in internal affairs, I think if we talk about this, the character or style of Tsai's leadership in domestic politics, that would be a very different story. Um, in domestic politics, he, she has to uh, coordinate with different factions within her party, and she has to uh, re resist the uh, the so-called dark green um, factions to to convince a more pro-independent independence policy. So uh, this has been this hasn't been easy, and this has this is why Tsai was able to convince the U.S. that she can control Taiwan. She can make Taiwan a stable and unsurprised authority that uh, that would not cause trouble to the United States. Okay, thank you. Now, to hear from one of Taiwan's smaller political parties, reporter Irene Zhou spoke to Chen Youchen, Taipei City Councillor from the Taiwan People's Party. Let's take a look. According to the latest poll by the TPOF, Taiwan is on the most satisfied that Tsai administration's approach to diplomacy with 61.5% of those pop giving a satisfactory feedback. On the Thai, relations between U.S., China, and Taiwan are under unprecedented tension. What changes to U.S.-Taiwan relations have you witnessed after Thai became president? 
。其实过往的蔡英文，或者是包括现在即将要选举的赖清德，他从这个台独精神。逐渐的走向中间，变成务实的台独工作者，就是看得出来说，其实不管对美中台，还是在台湾的蓝绿白中间，我们越来越清楚，台湾人民需要一个很务实、理性，而且能够坚守民主、自由这道底线，是大家共有的共识。那我个人认为，从民进党的执政，包括呃蔡英文这八年来，就是欲趋向于理性务实，不管是地缘政治，还是经济上面的依存。在美中之间，台湾扮演的角色跟台湾必须要有自己的主体，这些都没有太大的变动。所以，我从台北市议员的角度来观察，我并不觉得蔡英文执政以后，有真正的这八年改善或者改变本来美中台三方的关系。只能说，因为台湾人民自自主的意识很强，我们也对民主自由坚守的这个底线没有退让过，所以至少这八年。哦，是台湾人民也让这条线没有被超过，那也并没有造成更多的区域性的冲突。我觉得这还是要给台湾人民很大的肯定。Overall, what do you think? Um, overall, what do you think are the Thai administration's greatest achievement and shortcomings? 我觉得它最大的亮点，哈、哦，就在今天访问的今天也通过了，呃，同性婚姻，它可以没有血缘关系的收养小朋友。那其实。在人权上面，必须还是给这个蔡政府很大的肯定。那第二个评，刚刚讲的是婚姻平权的评。第二个评，我觉得对蔡英文最大的亮点是他在党内的派系平衡这一件事情，我觉得也做了很大的努力。所以看得出来，民进党虽然经历过这么多地方选举的这个，不管是他的挫败，或者是他明明在党内派系杀的见刀见骨。可是总能够面对每一次大选接踵而来的大选，好像还是有一个呃比较团结的氛围营造，这还是民进党给外部蛮蛮大的一个印象。所以我觉得亮点的话就是婚姻平权跟党内的派系平衡。那至于他的弱点，其实刚刚也有提到，我认为经济民生一直是民进党最对不起台湾人民的地方。呃，大家经过这八年以后呢，他过去说劳工是他心中最软的一块，可以看到现在的台湾的人，呃，台湾的劳工环境并没有比较好，那薪资条件、待遇以及呃 GDP 的这个呃平均所得，我们的可支配所得，台湾的劳工其实活在一个很辛苦的环境，可倒过来说，台湾的资方又面对一个。到处缺工的状况，执政八年，房价除了飙高，可支配所得减少，年轻人更加的买不起房。这件事情也是民进党跟蔡政府过去答应年轻人并没有做到的。你很难看到民进党他蔡政府在中央地方哦，总统府、立法院这个所有的行政体系资源一把抓的状况。有效的解决人民最基础的这个民生经济的问题，我觉得这是他最大最大的弱点，也是我在地方服务这些日子以来，大家对民进党感到最失望的地方。On April 5th this year, Tsai Ing-wen met with U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in California. It was part of her U.S. stopover, returning from allies Belize and Guatemala. The trip made global headlines because of China's threats. Let's take a look at what McCarthy and Tsai said. At the time. I believe our bond is stronger now than at any time or point in my lifetime. The friendship between the people of Taiwan and America is a matter of profound importance to the free world. It is no secret that today, the peace that we have maintained and the democracy which have worked hard to build are facing unprecedented challenges. We are stronger when we are Together, Raymond. So McCarthy there says Taiwan-U.S. relations are at their best yes. ever, yes. and many are also saying that you know Taiwan-China or U.S.-China uh, relations are at their worst. So what are the factors behind this? Right. Uh, I think uh, on the part of China, there's a, there was has been a sense of urgency on the Xi Jinping's part. Trying to uh, utilize the situation to take back or lure back uh, Taiwan to its own control, but uh, in terms of uh, Taiwan-U.S. relations, and I think we advance from friendship to alliance. 
uh, actually it has been reflected in not only the domestic legislation of um, U.S. giving Taiwan the non-NATO major alliance status, mm -hmm. and also uh, from the uh, president's promises and from the time and time uh, repeated um, uh, promises that uh, Taiwan-U.S. Uh, alliance and relationship is ironclad. And also, it's not only in the, with the U.S., it's also uh, improved. Uh, Taiwan's being understood by its European allies, especially in Eastern Europeans. That's out of the threat Taiwan has been facing, the shadow of a big power which won't renounce the right to use force against you, and uh, you s facing the also the exertion of sharp powers to subvert your own democracy and utilize the collaborative voices within you mm. to utilize the open society's features to subvert the democracy. Mm. And how much is that this down to Taiwan? Well, Taiwan was the target for of attack. I think no matter who is the president, China didn't give the, the president, especially a president elected by the Taiwanese uh, voters, populace, that won't go with a totally in obedience or go alongside with the Chinese political agenda that will meet the same fate. And may I just uh, add one word, the next president, if it's out of the, well, the Taiwan's populace and won't go with the Chinese agenda, he or she will have to prepare for war. That's mm -hmm. we we need a Zelensky for Taiwan. Mm -hmm. We need a resolute leader which can organize and co co collect all the forces we get and to get all the alliance we can get and to figure out the smart strategies, not only to deter war but prevent the eventuality of war. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. Ambassador, well, I don't think the situation is that dire. Um, there's been recent reporting out of Japan, for example, that. There are certain signals that uh, China has been trying to subdue the rhetoric about getting ready for war because I think they feel it's not in their own interests. Uh, it's scaring their own people. Um, then you have to look at the fact that Japan and the Philippines now with, uh, you know, uh, Marcos in power is much more also concerned about China and the threat to China. I just saw yesterday that the Filipinos are now putting up buoys with their flag on it around some of their islands. So I think it's a common concern in East Asia. So, you know, you've had also developments like Alcos, um, you know, the co collaboration with the UK and Australia, uh, the Quad. These developments all designed to build, you know, defensive mechanisms against any protect, potential attack from and China. Much, and how much of it is down to Tsai Ing-wen, though, and her policies and her well, character? I think it, it's contributed, you know, the fact that she's taken such a steady hand on the, on the steering wheel. Yeah. Um, and the relationships with the U.S. And with the, yeah, relations, the bilateral relationship with the United States has clearly never been better. But on the other hand, I think it's just, you know, we have to give credit to Xi Jinping. He has scared the hell out of so many people that they're all now saying, hey, you know, this is a threat to all of us. Um, you know, because, and they all recognize, uh, Japanese, Kishida said this, that, you know, if it's a problem for Taiwan, it's a problem for us. Mm. So it's, it's a bigger problem that he faces than just Taiwan. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Jerry, so in fact, the deter deterrence against China is Taiwan's own strength, mm. Taiwan's allies. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the U.S. still plays the most important role in this region. Mm -hmm. I want to echo what Dr. Chen just mentioned about the, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, Raymond just said about the major non-NATO uh, ally status, uh, the MNNA. Uh, uh, there was, there is probably the most important clause in the Taiwan Policy Act, uh, but mm -hmm. just bear in mind that this Taiwan Policy Act bill just got clear in the Senate, but still waiting to be clear in the House, right? And if, and if, if you do remember, the, the major non-NATO ally wording mm -hmm. appeared in the very first draft of mm -hmm. the Taiwan Policy Act bill, and then it was modified and then rewarding 
in the in the version mm. sent it to the Senate. So we are we are not sure what will be the last version. Mm. Got clear, um, you know, got passed in the two mm. chambers of, of of the. So the, the original Congress. wording, Jerry, was that Taiwan should be Taiwan come. will be treated, will be given a an, 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 the, the major non NATO ally status. status. If they mm -hmm. You know that's come true. That means the U.S. will have the legitimacy to use its force if anything happens in the Taiwan Strait. Okay. However, that wording was modified when it was sent mm -hmm. to uh, the Senate uh, floor. Mm -hmm. we, we we are not sure. I'm I'm sure there are people not, on the extreme left and on the extreme right. right, right sure who don't want not much better than, than mm -hmm. I do. But I'm just thinking. Doubt on that. It's uh, right. advancing. Actually, the sales of uh, weapons, the provision of the articles that. Uh, one needed actually advances even after that. Yeah. So we don't have the, any doubt the on number of the U.S. commitment to defend Taiwan. What's more, right, in the version of the, but I'm just saying. But uh, still, the amount of arms is mm. so gra vastly increased. Yeah. I mean, the defense relationship has never mm. been stronger. I yeah, think. I think what, what I'm trying to say is that the U.S. has been very cautious about the gesture. The U.S. Congress. <laughs> the U.S. Congress yeah, <laughs> uh, has been very cautious about yeah. the, the message and the attitudes. Sorry, the U.S. administration has been right, very cautious. Right, the U.S. administration okay. has been very cautious about mm -hmm. what message is going to send mm -hmm. to China. Mm -hmm. And I'm so curious about what will be the last version be. Uh, and uh, about the, the role played by China, actually, I think Xi, Xi Jinping just uh, uh, gave a phone call to Zelensky like, like two weeks ago or something. So, um, my observation is that China has been so um, so holding back in its in its in in its attitudes towards the Ukraine thing, and I think China is to trying to fix its ties with the U.S. and that may be, uh, as Bill just say, he doesn't think the situation is so dire. I, I agree too. I agree too. I don't think China would do anything that stupid, that provocative in the near future. Okay, yeah. Professor. I just want to add that the status we talk about is, uh, as far as I understand, it facilitates the on acquirement process. So uh, if Taiwan is given that pro that status, uh, that, that will give Taiwan uh, a, a shorter time to acquire arms and we can acquire more items of arms. Um, and, and so, so you're disputing the fact that it would mean that they come to Taiwan's defense, is that right? Well, um, it only means that uh, Taiwan and U.S. has more armed cooperation. doesn't mean that Ta the U.S. will necessarily send troops to yeah. Taiwan. Well, people are asking this, right? This, yeah. this will never happen definite answer because the U.S. government would not give a definite answer. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing we know is that if the situation goes dire, if uh, the U.S. believes uh, that the disability in Taiwan Strait is caused by the mainland, then uh, the U.S. is more and more likely to send troops to defend Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Raymond, let's talk yes. about strategic ambiguity and also Joe Biden's yeah. comments where he did say four times that Taiwan would, uh, sorry, the U.S. would come to Taiwan's defense and as Abasta said, it was then walked back. Well, it's very clear that the U.S. administration and from the, uh, you know, the uh, former commander of the Indo-Pacific forces and also testified by the defense minister, uh, secretary, or the, you see the CSI's war game, that's the U.S. is prepared the for the eventuality of a war between U.S. and uh, China over Taiwan. And uh, the alliance building in this region is also preparing for one, one reason is for that. As another is a major one is the threat posed by North Korea. And of course, this uh, area is, has been the flashpoint of the global security. There's no doubt about it. And uh, the policy of China, China, well, you know, it goes up and down. So you never no, but the courses of they took is very definite. They want to draw Taiwan closer to China, if not by drawing, but by coercing or even threatening. So we are facing this threat every day. Now we see in every front, in the elections, uh, democratic elections uh, in, in Taiwan, uh, China has its own agenda to, to let a, a friendlier figure to be elected so that he could compli complete its agenda through him or he her. But if not, he will, she will show his own hands. So 
the, the threat won't go away. Not on, not be, uh, please don't give too much weight about the soft wording or the pretended stance that China has putting on to say it could be a peace broker, it could even to, to be a go between between Russia and Ukraine. Don't be fooled by that. Uh, she's uh, plan for Taiwan is very clear. So we, we are not going to be diverted by any distractions that uh, uh, the theaters uh, put up by China. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think we should exaggerate um, the strength and ability of uh, China. There's been a lot of reporting recently, for example, that the GDP figures for China may be entirely fictitious. You can find many speakers, economists, uh, mm -hmm. online, uh, on YouTube, who have talked about this, that it, they're entirely made up figures and there's no justification for them based on everything from the degree of lighting in cities at night, uh, but also looking at their own figures that don't make any sense. Um, the other thing is they, they have a real population crisis they're facing now. They have huge youth unemployment. Uh, this is something I worry about also for Taiwan. Mm. Uh, but, you know, the, their, their population figures, Peter Zeyan has talked about this a great deal. Um, you know, they're going to have problems because if you don't have enough young people, you don't have customers and you don't have enough workers. And meanwhile, they're going through unemployment. <laughs> mm. um, and particularly for young people, there's concerns that the dissatisfaction, if you're young and you can't get a decent job, now uh, they're talking about go back to the countryside. We're going to have to send young people to the farms. Mm. The last thing you want to do is take somebody who's been educated in university and say, well, go, go work in the fields. Mm. It doesn't go over well. Mm. I mean, if you've had the taste of the city, it's hard to go back down to the countryside. Mm. Ambassador, you mentioned the, um, the articles that have been allowed to surface where um, usually they would be censored, they'd be taken down straight away. So, and these are articles by Chinese um, yeah. analysts and researchers, and they're talking about essentially a four, four front strategy, which is you know, China being attacked from essentially the US allies, so South Korea, Japan, Australia, and India. Um, however, you know, we, in terms of agreeing with, with Raymond, this could just be you know, slowing things down a little bit. Yeah. The no, intent is still yeah. so-called unification with... There's no doubt in my mind that's their <laughs> ultimate goal. By hook or crook, they want to control Taiwan, take it over. But um, I just think that there are more obstacles in their way than, you know, sure. than we may think. Um, yeah, you know, and that they are more aware of it than... And they're more aware think. of it than they say. Um, I, I want to add that. Uh, we, we have that conclusion because in the past, for various research, we, we have found that uh, whenever China ma faces an internal crisis, their foreign policy will stop. Their, their foreign advancement will stop. They will become more inward uh, going and more likely to negotiate pe peace with neighboring countries. So this is empirically supported. Mm. I see. That, that, that's, that's fascinating. So what you're saying is that it is an encountering some troubles domestically, and therefore it wants to you know, put the brakes Maybe. on any... Maybe. Any aggressions towards right. Taiwan. So, so right. what are those problems? Are they the ones that Ambassador mentioned? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The population, uh, employment rate, uh, economy. economic down, downturn, mm -hmm. and also um, the secessionism within China. Okay. Those okay. are all the load of vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. yeah, just one Raymond. One. But all those are for rational decision maker, but Xi Jinping <laughs> and Putin is not, are not rational figures. Please factor in that. They, mm. they will go to to achieve their aim at whatever cost, and not, not only human cost, economic cost, whatever. Absolutely. So China has made no secret that its goal is to so-called unify with Taiwan before 2049. The CCP insists that it prefers to do so through peaceful means. And yet, since Tsai Ing-wen took office in 2016, China has refused to speak to Taiwan, calling the governing DPP secessionists or separatists. This is because the Tsai administration doesn't accept the 1992 consensus, an agreement between the Chinese communists and KMT that both sides of the strait are part of the same country. At the same time, as refusing dialogue with Taiwan, Beijing has stepped up its military intimidation of the self-ruled nation. 
Jerry, let me yeah. come to you first. Okay. Um, you know, Taiwanese are do appear to be more worried. There's a National Policy Research Foundation saying that you know that more than 50% of people are, are worried about about war now breaking out with China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, has Tsai Ing-wen over the past seven years has she strengthened Taiwan's defenses? I I, uh, I think in a way she does, and I think the next uh, the next stage in the next four years will be about uh, the availability of chips. Uh, and, you know, there was a book it's called uh, The Chip War just coming out, right? And uh, many people were talking about this. I, I think, you know, I think the best thing uh, Tsai has, has done is to assure the U.S. that uh, she, she would not be the one who changed the status quo. And so for the next leader, uh, for the next president in Taiwan, he or she has to also convince the U.S. that no matter who wins the election, this person will not be the, stats, uh, the, st the status quo changer. And uh, the, ability, the capacity, the ability of, uh, make, of making sure both Taiwan and the U.S. can acquire sufficient um, uh, the chip making um, ability will be a very important factor. She mentioned conscription as well. I mean, yeah. that's one of her great achievements because, of course, it was Ma who reduced it to four months. And there's huge amounts of evidence that this was totally a joke. Mm -hmm. So the fact that uh, there's a commitment to conscription and actually was supported by the majority of the Taiwanese people mm -hmm. is a very important way of ta letting the U.S. know that Taiwan's serious about taking its own defense seriously. So that's, that's a very positive move. And I agree with you, this assurance about, I, you know, one thing I would like to see is, for example, uh, the DPP candidate, future candidate, I'd like to see that person go early on to the states and build, start building contacts to and, trust, to, and trust and to trust. prepare for the future so that, you know, gaining the confidence mm -hmm. that everything's going to be all right in this transition a year from now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Raymond, yes. um, you know, Ambassador mentioned uh, yeah. conscription there, extending yes. that to yes. one year. It's going to start next year. Um, how about anything else? How about defense spending, you know, indigenous think, um, defense industry? Yes. I think the Taiwan has uh, uh, every good intention to strengthen Taiwan's capabilities, there's no doubt. And uh, her awareness about the need to uh, fortify our Taiwan defense has come uh, very, very clear at the beginning of her administration. There's no doubt. But the situation, the reality is there's so much to do. And actually, Taiwan has mani uh, maneuvered uh, safely through the criticisms raised by uh, U.S. Uh, that uh, Taiwan's defense are not so uh, up to the job. And Taiwan needs to demonstrate more about its resi resilience, uh, the willingness to resist. And in a democracy, it takes real price. And uh, no matter into uh, the defense uh, spending, uh, investment or increase of uh, uh, procurement of weaponry systems and uh, all those uh, po real choices that to be need to be communicated with the populace to real to let the people realize that that's the price we are willing to pay for our collective security to the preservation of our own ways of life and that's the tough job for uh, Taiwan and his uh, successor. Mm. Professor, is, is Taiwan preparing the population, preparing the defenses of Taiwan mm. adequately enough? I, I think we can come from the, uh, the reduced time for uh, military service for the past couple of de decades. So uh, for the last 20, 30 years, the Taiwanese military has advocated a strategy of uh, facing off the, the enemy offshore so, and dis make a decisive battle offshore. So we dedicate most of the resources to Navy and Air Forces. And in, in return, you don't have law, you don't have that you don't need a large army. And that's why the military service has been reducing since the Sun Shipping era. And of course, for four months is absurd. We know, all know that. So um, of course, the, the resume of conscription, conscription is a show of resolve. The other thing that we have seen changing during the Tsai Ing-wen's period is that uh, Taiwan gradually divert or changed its strategy 
Uh, now we are buying more javelins or uh, or the yeah. or the, the missiles, right? Sting sting missiles because. We yes. think now that war was, will come to Taiwan and uh, down the island, and and we will have to fight enemy on the island. So there is a change of our defense defense plan that's, as that's a result. That's a very important point, Pinkley. Right. Um, I think one of the biggest things that upset me from the time I was at AIT until afterwards was, for example, the military wanted to buy tanks. Well. If you're going to fight with tanks, where are you going to practice with them in the fields where people are growing crops? Right. But moreover, it's too late. So mm -hmm. the, the recommendation had always been get more and more mobile missiles that can be right. moved around right, right. to make sure that those ships and airplanes, they don't land. Mm -hmm. So I think this has been a fundamental shift that's very important. Mm -hmm. So that's the asymmetrical defenses, is yeah. it? Yeah. Well, right, okay. that's part of it. Sure, right. sure. Um, Jerry, yeah. can, we, can we move to, um, you know, the, let me ask you a simple question. <laughs> can China achieve peaceful unification, so-called unification, if it doesn't talk to Taiwan? <laughs> I honestly don't think so, and I, and I think most people in Taiwan will not accept this offer by China. So that's it, it's not going to um, happen um, soon. Mm. So we've come to the end of the, the show now. I want to just ask very one last, last question. Mm. What do you think will be Taiwan's priorities in her final year in just a few words? Ambassador. I would like to see her actually um, in this final year <clears throat> spend more time on some domestic issues mm -hmm. because Taiwan also has a population problem. It also has uh, universities. They're not going to have any students. Mm -hmm. um, what are they going to do about that? I'd like to see uh, wages have been stagnant in Taiwan, um, which, is, you know, this may also affect her, her popularity currently. Okay. She really is focused on international affairs, and there's a lot that could be done at home that hasn't been done. Okay, Jerry, a yeah, few I words. Th yeah, I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Dr. Uh, President Tsai has done a very good job in terms of the trust building with the U.S., and I think as the president of Taiwan, she, uh, it's important for her as the president to deliver a message to the U.S. that the next president of Taiwan will still be a very good trust uh, person. Okay, Raymond. I hope she will insist it, uh, uh, on the that non-subjugation of Taiwan to China and to carry out, carry on with her works even after she uh, uh, stepped down from the presidential place that to being an ambassador at large for Taiwan in inter international arenas. Mm -hmm. Professor. I think uh, her priority will be making a balance within her party, making sure that all factions are suppressed in some way so uh, no factions can dominate the uh, political agenda. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for joining Taiwan Talks today.